Hello and welcome to everyone participating in the NATO Preparedness Summit um, virtually for 2020. My name is Dr. Karen Bolter and I'm really excited to be sharing with you today about the Florida Hurricane Response Hub and I have a lot of information for you and it's centered around two themes. Um, mental health and climate resilience. And I'm gonna be talking about how our hub has been building uh, workforce capacity um, in terms of addressing these needs. This is the core team for the hub. Our backbone organization is the Florida Institute for Health Innovation or FIHI. Um, you can see the team here, I've been working um, to manage the project with Caitlin McGoigan since January of 2019. And you can see our focus areas do include the topics I'm going to be covering today. We also work with a range of other partners around Florida. This project is funded by the CDC. We work with five other hubs under NNPHI and our partners uh, range from the Department of Emergency Management, the Health Department, uh, academia, grassroots organizations, and healthcare coalitions. So we've all been working together to build disaster-related public health workforce through trainings, technical assistance, and partnerships. And we really focus on connecting people and services. Now I have this slide up with these graphics because um, I just want to off the bat talk about COVID-19 and how it's become integrated into what we're doing, how we adjust our efforts and how it fits into the larger context of things like mental health and climate change. Um, we know that what's happening now is not the end. Uh, everyone thinks there's gonna be a vaccine and all of this is over, but um, I've seen a lot of headlines that COVID-19 is a dress rehearsal for climate change. Um, it's funny that the denial kind of makes us climate scientists, you know, <laughs> we, we look at the epidemiologists and we're like, yeah, we know how you feel with all of the people that think masks are not safe. Um, I'm in Florida, just on the news last night, there's a sheriff that is banning everyone in the county from, that works for the county for wearing masks. It's really crazy. and. Um, we're working to kind of get rectify the misinformation and share a lot of information about the cascading impacts and dual disasters. So I'll talk more about that. Um, one example that with those dual disasters is, oh, how are we going to adjust the evacuation response? Um, when there's a hurricane approaching during the pandemic. And we saw that with Isaias. Um, so a lot of the work that we've been doing is working with the emergency managers, Red Cross, to kind of understand um, what rules need to be in place in terms of social distancing and sanitation at the shelters. Um, how should we be adjusting evacuation, especially on public trans transit? And then even afterwards, um, the availability and safety of the response teams is important. Um, so some resources that we put together that we've been sharing include the CDC guidance on these dual disasters and a few other important resources that you can explore here. Um, but just to summarize the CDC guidance, definitely they're prioritizing smaller shelters and of course, isolating symptomatic people. Um, they have a lot of suggestions on um, what supplies are needed, how much PPE, and the state of Florida has a really great uh, disaster response initiative that has been putting out a lot of information. Equity is at the core of everything, and it's very deeply connected to hurricanes, climate change, and other environmental issues. Um, we know that equity is different from equality and that the reality of how things are today, it's dramatically causing this divide of opportunities that are available to different um, communities based on 
income and other um, disadvantages that occur. And climate change is a threat multiplier where people that are already being impacted are gonna, their, their impacts are gonna be exacerbated because they don't have the resources to respond to risks like others do. We're gonna get into our first topic, um, discussing methods aimed at increasing the workforce's mental health resilience. And we've worked on focusing on how participants will walk away better informed on the methods available to address and increase behavioral mental health capacity during dis d extreme disaster events. So I wanna share with you um, one of our trainings that's the safety function action training. It's for disaster responders and it's based on this disaster ecology model. This is very holistic um, in terms of looking at risk and resilience factors. So the safety function and action are the three keys to disaster health. And within those, there are six strategies that the training goes through. Um, and you can see that within these six strategies, there's a lot of other skill sets based on how to prepare and how to respond. For the prepare and practice skill set, um, you see we have the range of six different um, capacity building topics where, um, you know, having these different physical, emotional, behavioral habits built um, increased, increased capacity when a disaster kicks in. So these are tools that we can use. Um, but a big one to focus on for mental health, of course, is stress and what does wellness look like in the face of stress and trauma? And we have this stigma about mental health um, and how it's, you know, as a health issue, how much of stress is actually a physical manifestation in your body versus how much is something that we have a choice and that we have control over, like the, the, behaviors and those themes that I mentioned on the previous slide, um, focusing on those to help us cope with stress. But within a disaster, a lot of these um, stress symptoms are physical. And so this is a great uh, definition of stress, that it's the subjective experience that occurs when we perceive that the demands of our situation exceed our resources to successfully cope with the demands. So having resources and having knowledge and information is really important to reduce stress and that can occur physically. Um, it's a product of the absolute magnitude of the stressor and the person's perception of stress. So we talk about shocks and stresses um, and the signs of them. So we have emotional stress and we have different um, thoughts that can impact us. And then we have the physical stress where these are actual things happening in our body that, you know, over time, we're just, it's our habit that we know that these are negative things that are scary for us. So this is an interesting kind of parallel between the two topics, the mental health and climate change, because there's different ways of framing in those different fields, shocks versus stressors. So a shock that I'll talk about later is a hurricane or something that just happens really quickly. And so our acute stress response to things like that are some kind of fight or flight response and is typically adaptive versus a more chronic stress over time, having you know long-term health issues or poverty, um, ways of dealing with that, those kinds of stresses are, are different. And um, recovery is not as easy from those types of stresses. And with that, I'll go into our next topic of climate resilience. And you can see the definition here from the Rockefeller Foundation that does focus on shocks and stressors and how we can not just bounce back from them, but bounce forward. The key impacts of climate change are increases in extreme events, so there's extreme heat, but also a little bit of extreme cold and changes in seasonality. But overall, we have global air temperatures and ocean temperatures rising, and that's connected actually to sea level rise. 
um, because of thermal expansion. The oceans are getting hotter, which means their volume increases. And not only that, of course, the, the glaciers, Antarctica and Greenland are melting and that's the land ice is contributing to global sea level rise. And there's also local sea level rise, which um, is influenced at the local level for different geologic reasons that the land is just changing elevation or um, if there's a lot of um, water being taken out, like in Louisiana, there's, there's taking out a lot of water and the, the water table goes down and the land condenses and sinks. Um, I have a background in geology. My PhD is in geoscience, so I do like to look at, you know, what's happened over Earth's history, not just when human beings have been here. And we have ice cores and all different types of proxy measurements that we can see over Earth's history. What has the temperature been? How does that correlate to carbon dioxide levels and sea level? And the Earth's sea level has changed so much over the history. Um, during the last ice age, 18,000 years ago, all of the um, part, a lot of the ocean was in the land ice, so the ocean was actually 20 feet lower. And then during the last interglacial, 125,000 years ago, land what the the water was 200 feet higher because everything was melted so we have seen those changes over earth's history not while human beings have been here um as dramatically but and another thing that's never happened before is the rate and how everything is tied to the past few hundred years and the industrial revolution and the problem is that these things take a lot of time to balance out and catch up and so the Carbon dioxide levels in our atmosphere right now, about 412 parts per million. The last time that the carbon dioxide was that high, sea levels were 30 feet higher and the temperature was several degrees higher. So um, it's in the pipeline, it just hasn't caught up. And so this is, you know, some of these projections, they go out to 2100, it's not gonna stop. Like this is a really huge problem that we need to be more concerned about and taking more actions for. So a great way to help people be resilient, especially in terms of mental health and helping them feel safe, is arming them with information about what is their risk at their neighborhood level, especially if there's a hurricane approaching and they're seeing these crazy storm surge estimates, you know, we have tools where they can look at their neighborhood and what the maximum storage surges could be for different category hurricanes. They can look at their flood zone. They can look at sea level rise projections. So all of these tools are really amazing. I've listed some here and the NOAA tools are especially wonderful. We actually did a webinar with NOAA as one of our trainings and we looked at all the different layers to look at, okay, what's for all of these different areas? And we explored all the different um, hurricane hubs. There, there's data for Puerto Rico, for Texas, all of the US coasts. You can explore the likelihood of risk in terms of tidal flooding, storm surge flooding, um, and then also the consequences of that risk, um, the impacts to people, to the environment, and to our infrastructure. So this is a great webinar, you can watch it, the link is here and learn more. I'm gonna focus now on sea level rise and South Florida. Um, we, and, and back to the shocks and stressors, I mean, uh, there's definitely storm surge is a big risk for South Florida, but then there's the, the high tide or the king tide. These are extreme events. Um, they were, have, already have sunny day flooding and it's happening more and more frequently. Um, Oh, I'm blocking the photo here, but it's basically estimated days of flooding per year, this map, uh, it, by 2060 with two feet of sea level rise, all of these areas are going to be inundated at least once per day during high tide if we do nothing. So with all of these problems, and you can see there's a lot of areas inland, um, those areas to the west, it's already Everglades, a lot of it, but um, these are areas that we really need to be focusing on protecting and not just looking at um, the physical protection, but when they are flooded, what are the health problems associated with standing water? You have disease vectors. Um, we had a Zika problem. 
and then there's issues with contamination and mobilization of different um, pollutants. So you have reductions in water quality. Um, I'll talk more about saltwater intrusion later. There's different socioeconomic impacts when I, like when I was talking about equity. Um, and again, vulnerable populations are gonna have greater impacts from sea level rise. I quickly want to share with you just a little bit about the history of Florida and our extreme water management um, practices over the past hundred years. We had the Everglades that was the river of grass. It was sheet flow moving south from Lake Okeechobee and then it's been so extremely managed. We have 440 miles of canals and those were dredged so that we could drain the soil and so using that dredge to kind of fill the suburban development. Um, so you can see here, this is an example of um, the Miami River and how it's changed since 1856. It's really, this is the downtown full of high rises and this area is very prone to flooding. So to illustrate what I said earlier about how extreme tides and sea level rise build the foundation that storm surge piles on top of, you can see in the map on the left, the areas in blue are parts of Miami that are projected to be inundated with a category one storm surge. It's about two square miles. And with one and two feet of sea level rise, that area doubles and then triples. And a lot of these vulnerable areas have affordable housing. The affordable housing is affordable because in a lot of cases it's old and it's not up to standards and very vulnerable to wind and storm damage. And affordable housing is such an, a, a terrible issue in South Florida. And you can see that on this map, this graph in the top right out of the five, um, counties in the country with the highest renter cost burden, you have Miami-Dade and Broward as numbers two and three. One thing that makes South Florida unique in terms of vulnerability is that we really have water coming from every single direction. It rains from the sky, we have water, we have a very shallow water table, we have water flowing from the Everglades, underground surface water, and then of course we have the coastal impact and all of these come together. Um, I mentioned the water underground and I have this kind of animation that I've put together so you can understand. We do have these multi-million dollar homes along the intercoastal that are still on septic tanks. And the way that a septic tank functions is that the, the ground needs to be dry, but we have this problem where we have a, um, you know, tidally influenced water table during the wet season, it's very, very high. And it's actually this kind of pressure of saltwater intrusion that's more dense than the fresh water. And it raises the water table to times where areas where several days per year, the water table, our aquifer is actually higher than the ground. And when you think about all of the you know, hundreds of thousands of septic tanks that we have that are not filtering waste properly. And then you have drinking water wells nearby. So it's really crazy. And I actually mapped the septic tanks around the region. And you can see there's that Miami River area and so many different septic tanks there. Um, this is up in Palm Beach County, where I actually have measured just raw sewage in this um, lake off the intercoastal. And then when you look at um, water wells, where do the water wells overlap with a shallow water table and with the septic tanks? So that's a great way to kind of understand where these different types of risks for contamination would be. So this map on the bottom left is actually um, looking at today, what is the current soil storage capacity, which, you know, if it's raining or there's water, where, you know, how, what potential does our soil have to store that water? Well, if the water table is up at the ground level, there's no storage. And that's the case in these areas in red. So you can see that it, it, there's a lot of coastal areas that are vulnerable, but also inland. And both of these um, different areas will be impacted differently, but we do have coastal and inland problems 
with sea level rise and saltwater intrusion. And of course, it's also a threat to our water supply because the drinking water wells have been contaminated um, by salt water. We've actually had to move a lot of them inland. So that takes me to kind of um, looking at the different layers of risk. So we've talked about the physical risk, the socioeconomic risk, the health risk, and how do we put all those together? Well, we can, we can compare relative risk and kind of find hotspots where there's a light, high likelihood of risk and there's a high impact of that risk. And so we've been doing that and really with the intention of increasing um, the workforce's climate literacy and using these tools to explore where the highest risks are and where they need to be prioritizing um, their efforts. So here's an example of some of the mapping and outreach that we've done to overlay the different risks. Uh, the picture, you can see Caitlin and I with um, the previous State of Florida Resilience Officer, and we were presenting our poster about the, um, these different risks at the Climate Compact Summit in Key West. And the map on the right, you can kind of see in Miami that we took that groundwater information and we overlaid it with um, different socioeconomic risk and then also with the different rates of um, pneumonia, asthma, COPD. And so there's a lot of information on this, on this map that can help you find a risk hotspot in Miami. So that conference was an annual summit that's hosted by the Southeast Florida Regional Climate Compact. It's four counties that came together and every five years they also um, put out sea level rise projections. So at that conference, they put out the updates for um, 2019 and the projections increased. I mean, we're really looking at um, several feet of sea level rise by the end of the century. And here's an elevation map just to really drive home this area. This um, there's a misconception here that inland areas are safe. And um, when you look at this elevation map, so anything in brown is above six feet, and anything in blue is below it. And these areas in blue, um, a lot of them. Oh, I can use the little this guy. So these areas are the historic flow of the Everglades. They're called the transverse glades or the sloughs. And they're a densely populated floodplain that's extremely vulnerable. And so in the, the land gently slopes down moving west towards the Everglades. Now the last map where we showed the social vulnerability index it was hard to tell with those circles and it was at the zip code level. So I also wanted to show you this map um, at the census block group level where we took 12 different health related and socioeconomic related indicators, weighed them equally and created this index to show relative risk uh, throughout the county. And again, we see that these you know, areas in red are at that mouth of the Miami River that's vulnerable and also in, in North Miami. Here's a slide with way too many words, um, but you can take some time to look at it and it's it's um, putting together all the different compartments that we talked about. The physical risks associated with sea level rise is higher storm surge, increased flooding and a raised water table. So with each of those three risks, you have health risks that are associated with them. The storm surge is that acute mental health trauma that we talked about earlier. Um, that flooding, uh, a big problem is exposure to mold. And with the raised water table, there's those septic tanks that we talked about. And then for each of those health risks, there's particular populations um, and really mostly groups impacted by inequity that are particularly vulnerable to those health risks. Like for example, with Zika, of course, it's pregnant women are especially vulnerable. Um, for mold, it's people with respiratory illness that are vulnerable. So uh, we really need to frame resilience in a way that hits home, communicating to different um, populations the context of public health and how it relates to disasters. I'm almost finished. Here's my references. And thank you. That was the end.
uh, um, feel free to reach out and ask any questions, um, especially if you want to know about tools or data. That's my favorite topic. And uh, hopefully we can meet next year in person at the Nature Summit. Thank you so much. Bye.